This week on The Best of the West, we follow two stone sheep hunters into the unexplored backcountry of British Columbia to prove that if you follow the road less traveled long enough, you'll find a dead end. The Best of the West is proud to be sponsored by the Wild Sheep Foundation. Since its formation almost 40 years ago, the Wild Sheep Foundation has raised and put on the mountain more than $110 million for the recovery of wild sheep in North America. Through wild sheep transplants, research, water development programs, and predator management efforts, wild sheep numbers have rebounded with incredible success. The wild sheep population in the 1950s was believed to be around 25,000. The population is currently at 85,000 and continues to climb. At the center of this success story are the Wild Sheep Foundation chapter and affiliate members that account for 12,000 individuals who are working to put and keep wild sheep on the mountain. Sheep hunting is the pinnacle of big game hunting in North America for many reasons primarily because to obtain a sheep hunting permit through state hunting agencies can take many years. All big game herds are managed to grow and sustain healthy numbers, so the availability of sheep permits are incredibly limited in most of North America. Aside from obtaining the permit, sheep hunting itself is very demanding. Sheep live in high elevations where access is limited and extremely rugged. Exceptionally alert and powerful, Sheep provide a very challenging course for those that pursue them. For this reason, most sheep hunts are guided by professional hunters. The Best of the West first crossed paths with Brian Martin, owner and operator of Asian Mountain Outfitters, three years ago. As an accomplished guide and hunter, Brian has hunted all over the world. Having hunted for many years and for many different species, Brian has been a part of some extraordinary adventures. As a Huskama Optics user and supporter, the Best of the West wanted to follow Brian into the field on one of his own self-guided hunts. This year, Brian was headed for the high country of British Columbia in pursuit of stone sheep and mountain goat with his good friend, Andrew Bromley. This is a difficult hunt. I love stone sheep hunting because the harder you work, the luckier you get. Some days you strike out, don't find anything. Some days you get rained out, snowed out, blowed out, fogged out. I think stone sheep are very challenging to hunt, but if you know what you're doing, you can have high success. You just have to know kind of in an area where they're going to be. Uh, this was an area we've never been in before. Uh, we never fly it, for, didn't scout it. I just, based on some friends, based on some history of the area, we figured there would be some sheep in here. I look for fringe areas, um, not places that everybody flies into with a float plane, not places that everybody rides your horse into or parks your quad and, and, and floats a river or something. So I look for places where they, most people can't get to, either because it's too much work or they don't have the right access to the plains or they just don't know about it. Stone sheep are hard to spot if they're down on the boulders and laying in the shale. Easy to spot if they're on a the grass slope. Hard to spot when it's raining and foggy, easier when it's sunny. So. Overall, stone sheep are probably my favorite sheep to hunt. I love Marco Polo hunting, but then you got to travel clear around the world and deal with a lot of guides that don't speak any English here. It's us and the pilots and Mother Nature and a good cameraman and a nice rifle. 
When the best of the West returns, Andrew Bromley takes aim first. My name is Andrew Bromley. I'm from uh, Kamloops, British Columbia. Uh, we're up here in uh, northern and remote British Columbia, chasing stone sheep and uh, mountain goat. I like hunting any species of big game in North America, but uh, stone sheep is extra special to me for a few reasons. In my opinion, they're one of the marquee uh, big game animals here in North America as far as remoteness in the wilderness and uh, the challenge itself in harvesting a mature stone sheep. I started my quest uh, chasing stone sheep about 10 years ago. I've never killed a stone sheep personally, so this is my first, uh, first trip this year going after them in the Less Than One Club. So here we go. This hillside's gonna have water on it when we get up there. We might want to get another. If we cross a creek here that's fresh, we'll get another liter or so. I'd like to always climb about two liters. Um, so here we go, we go up through here. And then the historical ram sightings. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had been in here years ago. They'd seen rams in here. Um, this mountain, this mountain. So in the direction we're going is, is all good potential. We're gonna start out more in goat country. But we didn't have any options. There's no place to land in this country that's uh, close to where the rams are. So today we may see sheep. I don't really expect to. If we do, it's a bonus. Uh, today we're going to get our elevation, get in a position, get a nice camp, and um, start glassing. The first step in stone sheep hunting or any kind of mountain hunting is kind of knowing where to go. Um, that becomes some area knowledge from previous hunters or from research you've done. I mean, you can look at Google Earth, you can look at maps, and it looks good on the map, but it doesn't mean it's going to be good when you get there. So some of it might be goat country, some might be sheep country, some might be no man's country. Hunt an area that's really remote usually requires lots of hiking, um, lots of bushwhacking, different, different ways to get there. But uh, we had some, a little bit of inside information on this from years ago. But honestly, in this particular place we hunted, nobody that I know of has ever hunted here, ever. And then we began our journey up uh, into the Alpine. And I kind of call it the hunting emotional roller coaster. Uh, when we first landed, uh, you've got the anxiety. We're here, we're by ourselves. What's going to happen? How are we going to do this? You're happy, you're excited, you can't wait to see stone sheep. Uh, you get halfway up through the shin tangle and the, uh, the underbrush and it's hot and then you run out of water and you're tired um, and you kind of come down off that emotional roller coaster and, and you get anxiety and stressed out uh, and don't know if you can do this, don't know if you can make it through the day, how am I going to get this done? And then we camped up in the Salb Alpine there that evening. Next day we hiked um, hard, but not crazy hard. We got up on top, found goat tracks, maybe a few sheep tracks, and then right before dark uh, we were finding a camp spot and then Andrew looked up and, and spotted either a small ram or a ewe uh, right before dark. We set up camp. The next morning we got up and um, I was in a hurry. I had to go take care of morning toiletries. and. I looked over like, oh, oh, sheep, rams. And then T stepped out of the tent and I think they saw him. Um, so they spooked, not bad, but went over the hill. We got our stuff gathered up. Uh, we didn't have packs or anything. Grabbed the spines, go tripod, rifle, uh, T's camera and took off. Well, we were looking and looking and, uh, and all of a sudden we got just past where they were and I looked down and spotted two rams. So we made a plan, figured that the one was for sure legal. We got down and the rams came by at about 240 yards.
So the sheep went over off into another basin. Uh, we kind of got our ducks in a row as fast as we could uh, and we began to stalk them. They went about two basins away and into some rock cliffs. So we watched uh, the behavior of the sheep and what they were up to and they began to feed back up into the basin. So we made a quick stalk and belly crawled a couple hundred yards to get in position for when they'd come out the top of the basin. I was super, uh, super nervous, super excited, trying to keep myself calm. Brian Martin was really good at uh, keeping me calmed down, making sure the cant to the gun was properly, making sure the turrets on the Huskama optics were set just perfectly. Three of the rams came up, the lead ram being the 10 and a half year old, came in at about 241 yards. And when that ram gave me an opportunity, I was able just to touch it off. In a matter of two seconds, I was, uh, I was out of the lesson one club. He's down, he's down. Did I tell you you shot the wrong one? <laughs> so the one thing that I'll never, ever, ever forget as long as I live is looking through the Huskama optics at my first stone sheep when he came out of the top of the base, and I truly will never forget that it's etched into my mind forever. There's an old saying that says the year that you start sheep hunting is the year that your ram is born. That's probably true for me. I think hunting is in everybody, but I think other people, it clicks more on an emotional level, which it really does for me. Oh, he's legal, man. Oh, he's worse. You're not going to go to jail today. <laughs> legal and age. You've challenged legal. yourself. You set a goal. You've gone after it. You haven't give up, given up uh, when you're faced with adversity. Woo! Nice, huh? That's what I'm talking about. Gorgeous. That is great. You know, deep. That's like a perfect stone sheet. This is a tremendous stone ram. He's nine or ten years old. I'm going to say he's ten and a half. Um, some people call him nine and a half. Everything you want in a ram. Good mass, good conformation, great hair, nice tips. You know, he's got everything. Um, healthy ram, but he's getting older, and you want to try and shoot nine plus year old rams. Pretty lost for words right now. It's a lifelong dream of mine. Uh, just want to thank Brian Martin T for sharing sharing this experience with me. Uh, say hi to my family at home. Uh, pretty emotional uh, experience, and uh, I couldn't be more excited. Good man. He's beautiful. right down the middle of the back. To see step-by-step -step instructions on Brian's method for preparing and packing a trophy off the mountain, please visit our Best of the West Facebook page to connect to the link. So we make our way back up to camp. We had some beautiful back straps and tenderloins. We were pretty worn out from the three previous days. Brian brought some spices up and we fed on sheep meat for about three days, which was an excellent source of protein to help rebuild our muscles. When the best of the West returns, Brian tracks down the ram he's been looking for, right here on your Long Range Hunting Authority. Over the years, the Best of the West has received some amazing pictures of trophies taken in the field from proud Huskama Optic owners. We are so proud to see the tremendous success that Huskama Optics has brought to our customers. 
So in return, we've decided to incorporate a new segment into our future episodes. The Huskama Team Challenge will be a viewer submission segment from you, the viewer. Each week, we'll feature a hunt from one of our loyal customers and viewers. Each submission that airs on the Best of the West will receive a Huskama prize pack. And at the end of the year, our pro staff will sit down and pick a Huskama Team Challenge winner. The winner will be provided a Hunter Elite Rifle System and a hunt that will be filmed and featured on one of our shows. So get those Huskamas and camcorders ready for some lights, camera, and action this year. Go to thebestofthewest.net for complete details on how to enter. For this week's viewer submission segment, we'll be following Jeff Gerhardt on his bison hunt in the beautiful state of Montana. Jeff is a team roper from Cody, Wyoming, and had the good fortune on winning this hunt as well as a rifle at a team roping event. Jeff topped his new rifle off with the Huskama Blue Diamond 3x12x42 scope. Going hot! Oh yeah, baby! Why don't you just hit that again? <laughs> yeah, no, that's excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Dialed in and ready to go, Jeff heads for the hills. As a management hunt, Jeff will be looking for an old bull that has long been separated from the herds. After looking over several small herds of bison, Jeff and his guide spot a lone bull off in the tall grass. As they sneak closer to judge the bull, the bull beds down. With no shot available, Jeff will have to wait out the bull until a shot presents itself. Just under 200 yards away, Jeff can place his shot with confidence. Boom, good shot, Jeff. Get another, put another one in, make sure you're good. What do you think of that, brother? Oh yeah, baby! Good job. Woohoo! Man, I'm proud of you. Thank you! Hell of a shot. Awesome! Everybody wants to get a bison, that's for sure, in their <laughs> career. Boom, good shot, Jeff. Get another, put another one in, make sure you're good. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Huge, He's probably 11 or 12. He was right here when he turned mature at seven years old. Right there, so he's, you know, right there, that had been his eighth year, ninth year, tenth year, eleventh year, and that's all he's growing this year. So he's oh, 11 uh, years old. You see that hair saying, stick your hand in there. Further in my oh, wrist. Yeah, Look how he's all polished. <laughs> all polished he's out. gorgeous. Yeah, he is a good, tremendous boy. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Finally got my bison down on the ground. It was the best thing that's ever happened. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody that's associated with this hunt. It was a great time, great fun, and I love my new rifle. As you can see, it's Will with Punch. Yeah. So everybody that needs a good picture, come on and join me, because I am Will happy. <laughs> the Best of the West would like to thank Jeff for submitting this week's Team Huskama Challenge submission and for allowing us to be a part of his hunt. Coming up on The Best of the West.
With Andrews rammed down and in camp, some of the pressure is now off. Well, not really. The pressure is now on Andrews' shoulders instead of his mind. Having traveled two full days from their drop-off position, they now have three options. Option number one, hike two full days back to the original drop-off point by the river and stash the ram there. Then make the two-day hike back and begin hunting for Brian's ram. Option number two, continue hiking and hunting with Andrew's ram until locating a second ram for Brian and then pack both rams out together. With packs now weighing in at over 120 pounds, and a second ram would put them each at about 150 pounds for the return to the river. Option number three would be finding a new landing strip above the Alpine where the pilot can safely land and take off multiple times to get everyone and everything off the mountain safely. If Brian and Andrew can locate a new landing strip, they can store Andrew's ram there until the pilot returns on day 10. If the pilot deems the new landing strip unsafe to land on, Brian and Andrew will have to make the hike back to the river and wait until the pilot can return, possibly waiting days or even a full week depending on the weather and the pilot's schedule. Having chose option number three, Brian and Andrew head deeper into the area knowing that if the pilot can't land on the glacier, a second ram will mean twice the load going back down to the river. This area is not known for Boone and Crockett rams, but it has uh, some nice sheep in it. So we dropped down the next day. Uh, again, we were fighting weather, uh, rain, uh, a little bit of fog. Uh, climbed a mountain, didn't see anything other than two small rams. Got up on top, you can see a lot of sheep had been there for a long time. Uh, we have made camp again uh, just before dark, uh, glass until dark. Brian shot a few stone sheep in his life, so uh, we're looking for something special for him, which we thought this area uh, was going to provide potentially for us, which was good and bad. Brian uh, had his sights set on many mountain ridges away, and we battled, dropping 1,000 feet of vertical, 1,000 feet straight back up, 2,000 feet of vertical, 2,000 straight back up, and hiking hard. I mean, we put the miles on, and, and we paid our price of admission on this mountain during this trip. Then we started to see some nice rams and some sheep, but still, again, quite far away, even after how far we'd walked. So we decided to go after those rams. Circle, we had to circle back around a glacier in order to go through a saddle to get to those sheep about three miles away. And in doing so, in the pouring rain, we spotted two different groups of rams in a basin. So we kind of hunkered down and watched those rams for the afternoon in the rain. Two looked really good and then another one came out so that group had a six in it and then we found another group of four and later joined up with another one so we had a group of five and a group of six and the one group had for sure two legals in it another one sub-legal maybe right there um, other group had one that was for sure legal so we had three rams between 36 and a half and 39 inches too far to age too far to do anything we watched them until they started and they, they bedded so that was no chance of making a play on them. We had 11 sets of eyes that would have been watching our sorry asses trying to go down the mountain. They would have ran away or gone up into the cliffs. And even though these sheep haven't been hunted much, doesn't mean that they haven't seen people. Several of those rams were old. And who knows, their natural instinct is if somebody's coming at them with three people, they may run. So better to be safe. We waited until they all started feeding for their evening feed. We dropped down, hit the creek, and we got about 1,000 yards from them. With light fading and the sheep still out of range, Brian has a difficult decision to make. Wait till morning and hope the sheep are still in the basin, or make an open stock to close the distance and take a last minute shot before nightfall. No way to get a stock on them. Uh, for, it would have been poor light for camera. They would have rolled off the mountain, they were too high, and we would have had to do an open stock for four to 500 yards to get within 500 yards. And we wanted to get 500 yards roughly or closer, low light, so I said, let's just sleep on them. Went back about 200 yards, set up camp. Got up at 4.30 in the morning, 
we, we got to where I could start glassing. Andrew picked up uh, one of the small rams walking down the skyline, um, and then three more joined him. And so we could see the group had split now. We got seven rams, we're missing four, and we sat there for 30, 40 minutes. I said, this isn't good. They, the big rams usually lead. So let's get out of here while, as soon as they walked behind the cliff, we scooted around the hill, came, reversed our, kind of our tracks, and we came into the valley. As soon as we came around, I looked up the valley. Uh, it was about, I think, 1, 850 to 1,000 yards. Saw the, the, two big, the two big black rams, the one that uh, Andrew named, nicknamed Grizzly because he walked kind of like this and was kind of lumbering. He's just a big, powerful ram. So we made a play. We got just around 575 yards, and they didn't know either, and they never saw us. Can you see him there now? Yeah, better position. It was raining on us pretty hard, and uh, my first shot, I hit him what I thought was pretty well, um, just a little bit high, but below the spine, and he acted almost not hit. He went into a coulee and came out, and now he's about the same range, a little closer, about 545, and um, for some reason I was hitting a little bit high. Andrew saw the shot over his back. I did a quick correction and, and hit him perfect right behind the shoulder. Dropped him, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Still going, I'm following up. <laughs> Brian was able to put him down with the Husk Mod Vantage at uh, long range, which was super special to watch a guy shoot a rifle like that uh, at that distance with that accuracy. Hey, here's this, this is a lamb tip. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, we just did our, some photos with the Ram. We got the Huskama scoped, best of the West rifle here. We got our proud gun bear, Andrew Bromley. He's a great gun bear. <laughs> this uh, gun killed his sheep about five days ago. And um, this gun, I, I used it to kill a doll sheep and a bighorn last year. So then less than a year, it shot four sheep. I'd like to thank Huskama for uh, sending a great cameraman, T, along with us and uh, for uh, getting me this rifle to use. I have lots of rifles, but for sure it's my best long range rifle for this kind of hunting. A four or five hundred yard shot is not very difficult. It's pretty exciting. Um, I'm looking for, I was looking for a really big ram. This is the biggest ram we've seen. We've seen some other sheep from two, three miles away. We don't know what they were that were rams, maybe bigger, maybe smaller. But Andrew's ram is not too far from here, so it made more sense to come back this way instead of trying to look for a ram we hadn't spotted yet and we only had a couple days of time so if you're going to do stone sheep hunting you need time so we've got two rams in what seven days this is my four stone ram i've never shot a ram in the same place i always like hunting new areas every year we didn't do any preseason scouting uh, did a little bit of homework got dropped off here and started hiking we've seen i don't know quite a few legal rams Although, again this is probably the best one we've seen and we probably shot a, two of the, the best rams in the area. If our pilot's going to be a day late, we might go hunt some goats. <laughs> we'll see what happens. For sure we'll eat sheep backstrap tonight. We already ate the other two sheep backstraps from his ram. He's dark, isn't he? Yeah. He's black just like yours. Beautiful capes. This, this one has a little wider face, I think, than yours. I think so, yeah. Yours is more uh, this color all the way up. So he's 38, and we measured him. He's 38 and three 38 and 7 eighths, 38 and 3 quarters by about 13 and a half inch basis. Probably be really close to 160 ram, which is a great ram. And uh, it's hard to get rams that are over 40 inches or over 170 for sure. Very difficult. 
Having rolled two stones and cut two tags, Andrew and Brian keep things rolling when the best of the West returns. That's the same goat, buddy. I love hunting because it, it definitely challenges you. I think it's a natural instinct. I, I compare hunting to sex. People say, well, why do you have hunt? And I say, well, why do you have sex? It's, it's, that, it's that natural of an instinct for certain people. I, there's certain, I think certain people are wired to be hunters. I think it's genetically it's something that humans have always done for survival. And I think we don't have to hunt uh, anymore, but I think we have that hunting genetics. We have the hunting desire and the thrill of the chase and, and uh, the challenge. I mean, some people hunt for the wrong reasons. Some people just hunt just to collect and brag to their buddies. Other people don't even tell anybody what they shoot. So hunting is a very personal thing. Um, but I think for me, I, I just like all aspects of it. It's challenging, it's fun, it's exciting. It, it pushes you to the limits. It'll make you realize what a real problem is. You know, not having you know, your, your steak cooked medium rare and, instead of uh, well done is not really a problem. <laughs> Your problem out here is not having, uh, running out of food, falling off the mountain. There's a lot of things out here that are a problem. I've almost died three or four times in hunting trips, either almost drowning, falling off a mountain, had close calls with bears, uh, close calls with airplanes. So really most of the world's problems are not, very, not really problems. So I think it makes you have a little bit better perspective as a hunter about life in general. And uh, you also can, you can shoot and eat what you shoot. And that's, I think a lot of people don't know where their food comes from. So being able to hunt and eat your own food is also nice. But really people say that we hunt because we, we want the food really. I mean, this is too expensive and too crazy just for the food. A stone sheep would be like a thousand dollars a pound <laughs> or a hundred dollars a pound. We do it because we love it. The meat is a bonus, it's great. I think hunters actually appreciate nature a lot. You can't judge hunting based on one hunter or one bad experience. Hunting is, some, some people are really good stewards and other people aren't, but a hunting in general I think is an amazing thing if that's something you're into. And a lot of people criticize hunting, but they've never done it. And I think most people that did it would at least, if you did this kind of hunting, this is definitely not like road toting uh, with, a, with a can of beer and shooting and stuff on drive-bys. This is the real deal. This is like mountaineering. Uh, combined with hunting and uh, being a naturalist, so it does a little bit of everything. We got up here, we set up camp. Yet again, we got rained in the next morning. Slept in a little bit because we didn't get set up till about midnight that night. And Brian kind of giggled away, half joking, half serious, convinced us into going to look for, uh, for a couple goats. We kind of walked not too far from camp. Lo and behold, there's two mature billies sitting there uh, up in a basin, little tiny saddle. We have to drop about a thousand feet of vertical into the valley bottom and get quite a bit left of these billies so they can't see us anymore. We filled up some water in the creek bottom uh, and we started to sneak up to the hill that uh, these billies were on. We crawled within sight. We were kind of trying to range and figure out which billy we liked, which one we didn't. Did we like both of them? Did we like none of them? They were out on skyline at the time and they went over the skyline. So we quickly got our packs all together. We climbed back over that, uh, that ridge, only a couple hundred vertical feet. Lots of goat tracks, no goats. Uh, so we thought, well, after glassing the whole area, we might as well spin around the top of the basin and, and kind of head out to camp and maybe they'll be out there. We're following a few tracks, head down, and both Brian and I looked up at the same time, and there's my Billy standing 391 yards away almost perfectly level from us across a draw. Dropped our packs, aged them, judged them, said, yep, that's the billy we want. We crawled uh, another 40 yards to about 351 yards. Brian got the Huskama all dialed in, the turret set in, set up for the win, make sure the rifle was canted properly. I didn't put one in, dry fire a couple times. You sure there's not one in there? Yep. Okay. Nothing in there. It's 350 exactly. 
do it again. Lift the bolt handle. And get that gun good. No camping. It's a big goat. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, see his shoulder? The cleanest spot on his shoulder? See that elbow joint right there? Yeah. Put it on that elbow joint. Are right, you ready, son? For information about international sheep and big game hunting, please call Brian Martin at 250-317-5525 or visit online at asianmountainoutfitters.com. For more information about the products and gear used in today's show, please visit longrangestore.com or call 1-866-754-7618. Okay, see his shoulder? The cleanest spot on his shoulder? See that elbow joint right there? Yeah. Put it on that elbow joint. Hey, easy, easy, I'm gonna shoot him. Okay, I'm gonna try it now a little bit. Okay, he's gonna stop right there. Oh, okay, hold dead center on the shoulder. Let him stop. Yep. Nope, nope, nope. I know. He's coming to us, or he's gonna stop. Wait, he's facing us. Don't do that. Good. There you go. You hit him really high in that, you call it a dead zone? Mm -hmm. That was a dead zone hit. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Good job, watch out. <laughs> and down, down went uh, again my first, uh, my first goat and just a, just a spectacular example of a mature Northern British Columbia Billy. I prepared quite hard for this trip uh, and just looking back on it, uh, there's lots of things I would have done differently in preparation for my next stone sheep hunt. Get your gear, test it, go out into the bush, train with a heavy pack, use your gear, become familiar with it and think of everything that can go wrong with it. That's easily the most important part of, uh, of being a successful stone sheep hunter. And another thing I've been reflecting on as we hike over some of these mountain passes and these glaciers is all the amazing people that I've met in my life through hunting. You know, Jim Sprangers was what uh, got me into the sport uh, and the activity of big game hunting when I was a kid. I can't thank him enough. He's taught me most everything I've known. A few guys that I'll use nicknames for, Top Cheddar, Old Cheddar, Top Pin. I want to thank my mom for, uh, for always supporting uh, my hobby and pretending that she's not worried when I'm out here gallivanting with a backpack. Uh, and just say hi to my uh, dad and brothers and uh, tell them I wish they were up here. There's a saying that your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude, which means, you know, have a good attitude, don't bitch and complain, uh, you know, you're going to have bad weather out here, you're going to be sore. No matter who you are, you're going to have issues out here at something. Either the shooting is going to be challenging, the weather, which can be cold, can be wet, uh, getting discouraged, not knowing where the rams are, and that's what makes hunting a, a big challenge out here. It's, uh, you know, you can be a rich guy, you can be a poor guy, but Mother Nature is the biggest equalizer. Stone sheep hunting is definitely not for the faint of heart, um, but if you go, you go smart and hunt hard, you usually be successful, at least have the opportunity to. So I, I love stone sheep hunting, it's probably one of my favorite animals uh, that I've ever hunted. <laughs>